Welcome to another edition of the Media Twits. I am Mark Glazer, Executive Editor of PBS Media Shift, coming to you from San Francisco. Um, we'll be talking about, we'll have Doug Rushkoff on talking about his new book, Present Shock. And we'll be talking about Yahoo's latest moves, buying Sumly for $30 million, an app run by a 17-year-old CEO. Was this a PR stunt? Um, they're also Yahoo looking into buying Daily Motion, and we'll be talking about Flipboard's new version where anyone can create a magazine. Um, but first, let's talk about Yahoo and what they've been up to. Um, Marissa Myers made news before we talked about her kind of work in the office, no working at home. Um, then she goes and buys Sumly for $30 million. It's a startup that's existed for 18 months. Um, has a 17-year-old CEO, Nick DeLuasio, and the technology is licensed from SRI. Some call it a PR stunt. Others said that it showed that Yahoo was serious about news apps and also trying to appeal to kind of younger programmers to come and work for them. Um, now there's rumors that Yahoo will buy video site Daily Motion, kind of a YouTube um, light um, owned by France Telecom. Um, to do more video and also to get more international users. Um, is Meyer, I mean, this is another kind of move to get a lot of attention and it's working. Um, do you think, what do you think this will do for Yahoo, Felix? Um, yeah, it, it gives them a little bit of buzz and good PR and it makes them seem sort of ahead of the curve and they already have, you know, Max Levchin on the board who's like the, the Wunderkind of 10 years ago. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't know anyone who's actually managed to successfully use this app to get information. It seems like the technology is a little bit weird. It's not unheard of for, you know, a slick presentation of someone else's um, sort of back end software to be worth more than the back end software. We saw that with. Um, when Intuit bought Mint, you know, that was all basically this company called Yodley's, which was, Yodley was powering Mint, but Yodley was worth nothing compared to what Mint sold for. Internet valuations are always weird. It's obviously like what's known as an aqua hire. Um, Marissa Mayer wants, wants Buzz. She wants um, this kid who clearly is a very sort of Silicon Valley style, aggressive young technologist. And frankly, you know, in the grand scheme of things, $30 million isn't all that much. So you can see why she did it, but it does seem a little bit superficial. Yeah, I mean, this, this space is kind of interesting, right? I think the other one that reminds me of the Circa, right? They're all trying to do news summaries in mobile form, but the problem with these is they're all kind of outside the stream of your normal social media or other news streams. So I think it's pretty tough, but as Felix said, thirty million is nothing for these companies. So it's it's one of these kind of stabs but in the dark. Maybe it's the, the, the other um, the other thing which is which is worth which is worth looking at here is that it does. If the, the one thing you can get for thirty million is um, you know some halfway decent journalism, you know journalists don't cost nearly that nearly as much, and there does seem to be this this very strong Silicon Valley bias against paying people to write things as opposed to getting computers to automatically you know produce stuff even when the producers computers don't automatically produce the stuff very well they'll still sell at a much higher multiple and at much higher prices than than people ever will so I think if we learned anything about Marissa Mayer here it comes as little surprise but it is that she is a Technology, a Silicon Valley technologist at heart is naturally suspicious of human being. Um, what about their move to not have as much original journalism? Because Yahoo is, I know Yahoo Sports is broken news and they have a pretty sizable kind of editorial staff. I mean, does this mean, I've heard they're kind of moving away from original content. Anna, did you, did you want to jump in? Yeah, for one thing, I think that'd be too bad. I actually think that Yahoo is doing some really good original content. Their political coverage has been great. Um, I know people who've been there, they've hired some really good people. I guess the question I have, it started out as maybe a smart-ass remark, but I'm, I realize I, it might be a genuine question, which is that has there been like a news app that's really revolutionized the way we consume news? Like it's mostly been like there have that's been apps that convey information like Twitter. 
but Twitter didn't start out as a news app. Right. You know, I mean, Twitter, what's amazing about Twitter, and we've talked about this before, is that it got hijacked by users to be what it is. You know, like, it started out with actually an admirably vague kind of sense of what it would do. And then it became this other thing through how people used it. Um, and I just can't think of, I think most of the apps that have really changed the way that we, that have really become a part of people's lives, have that kind of, um, have been able to be hijacked, like Instagram, you know. Like, I think what's, one of the things that's interesting about Instagram is the way that people use it to share not just photos but also text. They take pictures of anything that needs to be shared and just use it as the, as the, as the medium for sharing because it's a very easy way to do that. Um, I just can't think of, and again, maybe you guys can, of any news-specific or aggregation-specific app or, you know, thing, you know, web app even, that is something that is part of my everyday life. You know, the, the only thing, the only one I can think of is the one that, that she kind of did for Google, which is iGoogler. For me, I mean, maybe it's, I'm super old-fashioned, but I still use the Yahoo, uh, you know, myyahoo.com is my landing page because I got my, you know, my Boing Boing and my New York Times and my news and my this, you know, that 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 as my sort of living daily newspaper. And I thought, great, when she went from Google to Yahoo, that it was like, okay, here's someone who still believes in the web, you know, and it seems not. You know, if she's going to leave all of these great web properties behind, it looks like she wants to sort of dance off into the sort of, you know, the app ether with Facebook and Google and not really do what I thought Yahoo now was the only only major player left uh, left to mine that space. The atmosphere. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's a good one. I mean, I, you see a lot of people who, when they heard Google Reader was dying, basically said, oh, well, I kind of went off of that. I've been using Twitter as my newsfeed, you know. So I think, as you said, Anna, that's what a lot of people have done is said that Twitter is so malleable in terms of what you can do with it that the idea of these specialized news apps that, you know, are where you live just doesn't really apply. For these younger folks, you know, Twitter and Facebook are the things that find them and, and they don't need a dedicated app for these things. There's a really smooth transition here to Flipboard if we want to make it. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. <laughs> sure. Like, and because I was going to say, like, we actually now that we think about personalized newspaper and, and my Yahoo and, and um, Google Reader, like, I, when I first discovered Flipboard, was like, this is the thing that is what I wanted out of Google Reader and just, like, the Internet in general. I don't find myself using Flipboard as much as I, I did right after I discovered it. I mean, that could be my own lamentable, like, short attention span. Um... I think I might try start using it again. It's especially good, actually, for like long reads. That was the thing that I I found myself really wanting to use it for was when it would automatically collect the hashtag long reads, and that's a good place to do that reading. Um, but the the new Flipboard, I I'll be honest, I haven't taken a look at it. But the idea of creating my own magazine, I don't. That's not actually why. I do want the web to curate things for me. Like the reason why Twitter works for me better than even Google Reader was because people who I trust will recommend things. You know, yeah, I mean, people are the, by far the best recommendation engines. And yeah. like algorithmic recommendation engines just never actually work that well on Flipboard or anyone else. Like, you know, the the reason if I want you know, for instance, Anna's um, long reads Flipboard hack thing. You know, the long form app is really good, and the long and the thing which makes the long form app really good is that it is curated by humans. And you know, and of course, the Insta Paper app is fantastic because it's curated by me, and it's all the stuff which I want to read. So you know, it's like you know, I, I'm not sure where the um, you know. There might be a point in the future at which computers get to know exactly what I like so well that they can put, sh just show me this amazing stuff automatically. But for the time being, it's clear that humans are so much better at this than, than algos, algorithms are. And one of the reasons why humans are better, I would actually say, is because humans are unpredictable. You know, I mean, I love it when in my feed I discover someone who I've been reading because I know that they're a good political journalist and it turns out that they also are a sports fan in a way that's very, like, in the way that I am, or that they have an interest in, I don't know, like, 
art or dance and that I didn't know that they had, but because I trust them in this one field, like I'm willing to follow them into another. I'm willing to dis to discover something that I might not have even expected from them or to come across at all. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, my, my my issue with Flipboard is is not so much um, the selection or the uh, what stories it pulls up, but I think I figured out why Flipboard gives me a headache, and it's why it's it's actual headache. Because basically you're you're reading all this content that you see in other wrappers and different fonts and different layouts, and suddenly they're kind of normalizing it into this kind of glossy, sans serif, polished format, and just trying to context switch my head to read an ESPN article here and then a Vanity Fair there and a Newswire article there is just somehow it just my head hurts because I don't I don't expect that form factor to match that content. And um, I tweeted out earlier saying I think it's kind of like the Muzak of content because it basically takes like Paul McCartney and 80s tunes and just puts them to the same exact kind of uh, uh, kind of sh sugary you know kind of format. And then um, one of my uh, old students who's at the World Bank said you know he considers like the auto tune of content, which I think is probably a better analogy for it. And I I just don't see it being the primary way that I can consume stuff. I'll jump into it once in a while. But somehow my head hurts when I try to consume you, content. You feel the same, same way about record. you feel the same way about Instapaper, which you can say the same thing about. Yeah, I, I just don't use those apps at all. You know, I still like uh, the only one I really use is like SkyGrid, but they have a very generic layout, and then you hit a button, and you're suddenly in the site where that content came from, and you're looking at it in the format that they they uh, actually used on their web pages. But somehow Instapaper and uh, Flipboard just just don't do it for me. I will. I'll jump in. I actually like um, Pocket um, for uh, my Instapaper, my Read Later app, in a way because it actually it will let you look at the original layout too. But for me, I guess this is just a taste preference thing because I like having. If I'm going to read a long form thing, I just want it stripped down to the text. Like I don't, I don't particularly. I I I think that the internet is still a bad place to consume gorgeous layout. Like I love a good magazine and a magazine that, that is beautiful to open up a spread in. I if it's online, I just as soon have a slideshow for the pictures and the text stripped down for me. But right. maybe this is just a taste thing. Could be. Yeah. Well, it's funny to think about how many different readers and, you know, from RSS, which is ages ago, you know, Google Reader and NetVibes and My Yahoo and all these kind of personalized pages now turning into news apps that kind of do the same thing but pull in from a lot of different feeds. Um, but no one really, it doesn't, Kinja. doesn't really think it's true. I don't think any of those have really broken through to become the, yeah, yeah exactly. None of those have really broken through. Maybe Google Reader, and that's the one that's being shut down. So, you know, and even Flipboard, you know, some people have looked at the numbers. They said they had 50 million users, you know, who have ever downloaded it. But as far as actual regular readers, everyday readers, it's in the low millions, you know, one, two, three million. And that's not, definitely not even close to something that's mainstream breakthrough. So it still feels like something that no one's really found the perfect formula for. Um, well, let's talk about, uh, we have Douglas Rushkoff here joining us, um, and he's he's been pretty much into internet culture, you know, in the early web days from the early 90s. He coined the terms viral media and social currency, and his new book is Present Shock um, that explains our situation with media and tech overload and how we need to take back control of technology. Um, Doug, you've had a lot of really interesting books. What was kind of the impetus for this book? I know it's a little play on Future Shock, but what was it? Was there a moment you had, kind of an aha moment, that made you think about the idea behind this book? Unmute. You need to, uh, you need to unmute yourself. The 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 aha moment is actually, I, in theory, is like an embarrassing aha moment in light of the conversation we were having before about reality television before we were getting on but I was actually it was I was watching um, Real Housewives of Orange County and I was they, they were having a fight about something they they were having one of their typical just go to lunch and have a misunderstanding and have a big fight and I realized that the reason they were having so many misunderstandings was because they couldn't make 
facial expressions that were appropriate to the emotional content of their conversations because they had so much Botox and collagen and stuff that their faces were frozen. And for me, it became this kind of perfect metaphor for this, this uh, uh, obsession with the moment in that they were, they were so dedicated to locking in whatever their face looked like when they were 29 that they became unavailable to the moment that their real body and, and, and soul were actually in. And it, for me, it became this kind of driving metaphor for uh, kind of the, the misuse of digital technology, where the original promise of this stuff was for us to be like this, you know, in our underwear, in our own time, working as we want, kind of free of demand, increased slack, making money, you know, in peer-to-peer -peer ways and in, in all sorts of decentralized, non-linear, non-corporate fashion. Yet the net that we built, either because of Wired or NASDAQ or market forces or VC or our own just sort of industrial age predilections, you know, the, the net we got ended up kind of robbing us of our time and turning into this uh, kind of, you know, insistent pinging of devices that we seem to feel the need to catch up with when we, and, and we refuse to acknowledge that we're the ones that, that all this technology actually should be catching up with. So that was sort of the, the gist of the of how it started. And what's it doing to the children? The children. <laughs> Always the chill. I know. I never I we were just talking. Whenever I try to do one of these PBS things, I, I like making these PBS frontline documentaries and I'll come up with something about sort of corporate malfeasance and how technology is being misused and they're always like there there are questions well, does television make children violent? You know, it's always this sort of same question. Are video games leading to, to you know, mass murders and chill in schools? And it's like, ah, oh, you have so many great people who can tell that story. Let me tell this other one about digital media environments and, you know, the, you know, the exacerbating the ills of the industrial age and local currency, you know, all the kinds of stuff that I'm interested in rather than the harm, you know, the harm to the children. But God bless PBS. That's why. Yeah. That's why we're. That's why we're here today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what? I love PBS. <laughs> so what? I would uh, like, hey, <laughs> what? What's your prescription? I mean, we know we we're overloaded. We've got too many things beeping. I mean, just Felix's room alone has twenty different things beeping in it right now. <laughs> um, but. Yeah, in two places at once. It's and Andrew's on <laughs> twice. So <laughs> we can't even possibly talk about deeper thoughts because we've got so many things jumping around at us right now. I mean, it, there's this whole tech Sabbath movement. I know it's Good Friday right now, but... That sounds like a know, really interesting cover band. <laughs> tech Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite of Black Sabbath. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, ironically, I kind of accidentally started the tech Sabbath uh, movement way back I wrote this piece for Adbusters called the Sabbath Revolt and the idea was you know what if we took one seventh of our time and just didn't produce or consume or this or that or do any of these things and technology was part of it but um, I think that's kind of it's kind of silly to have this oh now is gonna be my technology free moment it's like, where do you draw the line? you gotta take off your glasses then right there's a technology oh and they were computer you know designed by computer and you can't you know it's I, I think the the answer is more about uh, uh, in, certainly in the tech realm, is kind of limiting the, the extent to which you've got these kind of digital representations of yourself out there functioning beyond your control. In other words, I'm, I'm less concerned about information overload or incoming data than I am about the fact that, you know, if I've got a Facebook profile out there, Zuckerberg might be using my image or those of people who've liked me to go advertise something. I, I just don't, I don't feel in control of my various uh, uh, online avatars and identities. And to think that they're moving on, when, when that's um, out of my control, that's, you know, that's when it gets a little weird. But I don't think the way is it, the way is to kind of leave technology, but you know, to kind of push through it. It's just to get our digital technologies to conform to our sort of more natural underlying cycles, rather than always needing to keep up with them. I, I feel like when we, you know, put a phone on yourself and have it vibrate every time there's an AP, you know, news alert that they think I care that Tiger Woods is now the number one. Who gives? You know, I'm living sort of in the in the life of a a, a 9/11 operator or a, a or a, a an air traffic controller or something. It's like 
It used to be the only time someone broke into what you were doing with it, with something else was, you know, grandma's dying or something, so they break into your phone call. You know, that's just not a sort of a way to live your regular life. I don't know if it's, I mean, I, I appreciate, I, I love that the book came from watching Real Housewives and the, with the Botox and the collagen, and, and I think that is an interesting, I, I think that's a spot on kind of, um, way to get into the idea that we're we're interested in preserving a certain kind of image and we're very conscious of image more conscious than we may have been in the past because we see ourselves more than we did in the past right i mean it used to take it used to be you had to look in a mirror to see yourself right and now the selfie is like one of the major ways that people use cell phones so um, and I actually have heard people like things like that. It's almost disappointing like to use your cell phone camera to see if you have something in your teeth you know to use your cell phone camera to like check out your hair, um, those things like are, are somewhat troublesome. But at the same time, like I, I, it's interesting that you go from that that idea of preservation of image to almost a parallel argument about what the internet was supposed to do for us was it you know untether us. I mean, because what I think is true is that we just have we. It actually goes back to the last thing you said, which is that we ultimately have no control. The only way we control our image online is to secede, secede from it. Like, if you, I don't think there's a way you can participate in the world without giving up a lot of control. And it's just a question of whether or not you're you're aware of the control that you've given up, and um, if you can, if you see what it is being used for. Um, I think I, that's I, I, I agree with half of that. I think that we have very little control. You know, your privacy is an illusion, and all of that kind of stuff I buy into. I would push back a little bit against the idea that we had a lot more control and a lot more privacy in some sort of halcyon point well, in the past. I don't think that's I don't just think we've lost just... control. I think we're just a little bit more aware now of how little control we had. Well, I just think I... we just have a new medium where we lose control. You know, I mean, like you can't we all control if you never have it in the first place. Well, no, but we always we only participated in you know. There's a new dimension of participation in the world. I would say, like, as soon as you leave your house, as soon as you do anything in the world, whether it's online or in the public sphere, like you've lost control to a certain extent of what people think of you, of how people use what you've said, whatever, how people convey the expression that you made. You know, it's just that we do have a medium where now the ability to take a picture of you and alter it and put it out for the world to see exists and that didn't exist before so that it, you may see you see that just as an extension of lack of control or more lack or, or, or to have even less control but it is a new thing it is a well, new way of losing control and at the same time it says a, a kind of a there's been a shift in what we think of as consumption you know from uh, you know, when when I was a kid, you'd, you'd go to Spencer Gifts in the mall and get a bunch of posters and stick them up on your bedroom wall and kind of reflect back to yourself uh, the, the person that you that you were forming. And now you do that in public. You know, you put these things up on your Facebook wall kind of as a, a performative act, and it's extending out and it's locked down. So the sort of the temporary experimental phase that I might have had as a kid um, is now a kind of a permanently archived timeline of, of my development. Bless you. Andrew, did you want to jump in? Oh, you need to un first. unmute. Um, Doug, I thought it was really interesting. I, I, I love your the points that you made. And then the fifth one that you made was really interesting about the, you brought in the zombie apocalypse on this, which I thought mm. was, was fascinating. Um, which, which, which really did distill down into what I was wondering why this became so popular recently. You know, we've always had kind of zombies and apocalypse uh, scenarios, but suddenly it's just caught fire. And uh, your, your uh, explanation is quite interesting. Could you sum that up real quickly? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, while, you know, while President Chuck may have been inspired by the Housewives of Orange County, you know, it's actually about what I think is a, a, new, uh, a new relationship to time that we have in, in the digital media environment, that we've moved from this kind of analog free you know, flow of time and this experience of stories with beginnings, middles and ends and movements with goals and moving towards things and eyes on the prize and ends justify the means, you know, a very kind of cause and effect 
uh, a temporal landscape to a very immediate one, to one that, like a digital clock, is kind of paused in the moment. And it's always, you know, 322, then it's 323, then it's 324, and these sort of moments of choice that seem to be in each one of them. And, you know, present shock is really the experience of disorientation, that vertigo, kind of the, the, the vertigo that, that, Andrew, you were talking about, that headache, you know, of, of, uh, of whatever, you know, whichever program it is that makes sort of everything look the same, you know, you don't quite have, you, you can't quite navigate, you don't quite have the bearings that you would have in a sort of a normal uh, news landscape where you can see the thing in its context and in its size and when did it come from and it's sort of further back. And the, the intolerance for this, you know, the people's inability to live in a world that is kind of always on and never ending, the sort of open-ended game rather than the grand narrative, I think that's what leads us to almost this wish fulfillment apocalypse scenario where, you know, you've got the, the, the so-called scientists and, and digerati talking about the singularity through which, don't worry, this is going to end because computers will overtake humanity and people can go away and information will rise to the next level of complexity. Or in more popular culture, you know, we imagine a zombie apocalypse, right, which in some ways is our, our dream, right? A zombie apocalypse is simpler than, you know, nothing's going to be tweeting and dinging at you. It's just slow-moving dead people, you know, that you can just shoot or whatever. And I find, I find people find it easier to imagine the zombie apocalypse a few years from now than they can imagine what's going to happen next month. Yeah, and I thought it was fascinating that, you know, you, you always had some kind of idea, of, at least with, with Christians, you had this whole idea of the rapture and an atheist couldn't buy into that. But somehow with the zombie apocalypse, this is something everyone can agree on, right? We all love this. It doesn't matter what your background is. Some of there's something weirdly, I don't know, attractive about the simpler life and the fact that we just need shotguns and some food and we'll be okay, right? It's, it's kind of odd. Yeah. Right, and then there's that satisfaction to, you know, storing all that stuff. They're all the preppers storing the stuff in their basements and it just gives you the sense, oh, you know, I got, I'll go back to Anna's kind of control idea. You know, and now I've got some control over this future when, you know, the future and the past just are conflating on us thanks to our digital technologies. You know, on Facebook, I just had someone right before I quit, this a, someone from second grade who I had gotten 50 years away from or whatever, 40 years away from, pops back into my present and wants to be up there next to all my current friends as if I hadn't managed to get that temporal distance. And meanwhile, on the other side of Facebook, there's market you know, researchers who are doing big data analysis on what I'm about to do in the future. So it's as if my future and my past are just come crashing down on my present in a way that feels, to me anyway, so oppressive if I don't kind of really take charge of it and go, you know, you are from 40 years ago and I'm going to make you look as small as 40 years ago looks. And you guys are not going to predict my future because just screw you. I don't want you to. So now that I'm thoroughly depressed, is there um, is there any solution to this, or or is the zombie apocalypse just the solution to all this? Oh, well, actually, it's not a bad solution. But um, <laughs> no, there's a, of course there's good. I mean, tell that to the zombies. Looking <laughs> 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 for them. <laughs> well, everyone roots for them. I mean, all the singularity people root for the zombies too, because basically that's saying, look, that's all we are. We're just zombies, so it doesn't matter. You know, the 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 real joy of the zombie movies or the horror is trying to differentiate between what is a human and what is a zombie. How are we really different? But and I would say that the, the path for me, the path to success, um, um, and to wealth and fame, um, is, is really... Buy my infomercial. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I wish. It's not fame anyway, but it's, it's it, or success, but it's uh, 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 orientation and lack of nausea, um, is to begin to, um, to take charge of my own time. You know, is to really differentiate between between Kronos, as Anna put in that suck piece, I just I, I was linking to it. Um, you know, Kronos, chronology, is sort of our name on time, our symbols of time, versus Kairos, which is the Greek idea of timing. You know, what's the best time to tell Dad you crashed the car? Right? It's not 522. Right? The best time, to, it's after he's had his drink, before he's opened the bills. Right? That's timing. So the more that we can bring ourselves into timing, and some of it is really strangely sort of new age science stuff about, you know, emerging research into 
um, the biological clocks and the fact that at each week of the month we tend to be dominated by a different neurotransmitter. So you find out, you know, it's like it goes from acetylcholine to serotonin to dopamine to norepinephrine. And if you start researching these chemicals and understand, oh my gosh, you mean the whole world right now is in a dopamine week? It's time to party, self-destruct, go down on ski slopes. Do oh, now they're moving it to norepinephrine. They're going to be analytical and fight or flight. You start to understand when's the best time to sell, when's the best time to work, when's the best time to socialize. You know, or you start looking at what are those things for you and then use these technologies to make the sort of business work whatever world conform to your schedule the way it was supposed to be when the slacker sold us on these technologies to begin with. Right. Actually, we might be turning the corner, right? We have this new movie called Warm Bodies. I don't know if you saw it, right? So it's, you can undo the zombiness. It's not a one-way trip. You can actually kind of wake up from this and go back to being a human again, right? So maybe that's kind of the... Acknowledgement that we forward. are taking control. You know, or go forward to it. Because you know, you go back, you end up in the industrial age, which was the sort of time is money, I'm gonna sell my time rather than make a thing. You know, and, right. and if we push through forward when you start to see Etsy and peer-to-peer -peer trading and peer-to-peer -peer currencies, you start to see there's sort of the retrieval of uh, the pre-Renaissance uh, modes of human interaction, which doesn't mean going back, but kind of pushing through to that more human scaled uh, landscape. Right. So Bitcoin is the future, basically. The future <laughs> so 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving on to another subject. Um, we'll, uh, obviously, it's a great book. We'll definitely check it out and hope that our audience, mm -hmm. I think it's something that resonates with the media twits and the media shift world. Um, but uh, Columbia Journalism School announced that they are not hiring a zombie as their new dean, but instead they're hiring Steve Cole, an experienced investigative reporter and editor at print media such as the New Yorker and Washington Post, um, but Michael Wolf, our uh, bad boy media critic, pointed out in USA Today that Cole had never tweeted um, until recently um, and doesn't really have a record as far as innovation, programming, technology. Does that really matter? I mean, should Columbia stick to people who have more of a traditional journalism background, or is it important to get a leader who is someone who's more digitally attuned. Um, what do you guys think about that? I mean, especially Andrew, you're at USC. Um, what do you think about what's going on in journalism schools and what this hire means, if it means anything? Uh, I'm probably not the best person to ask because I'm certainly uh, part of the problem, or part of the system, I should say, maybe not part of the problem. But, uh, but certainly, I would, if I didn't believe in journalism schools, I wouldn't be teaching at one. But I think um, most of the critics who criticize journalism school work with the erroneous assumption that people who run journalism schools or teach in journalism schools think that everyone should go to journalism school or anyone who wants to go into journalism should. And I constantly give advice to people who are interested in journalism school not to go to journalism school. Um, and that's something a little bit different than MBAs or a law degree where you know, there's a, you know, either a certain certification or uh, a pedigree that's important for certain types of things. So I'm constantly telling folks that journalism school is not for everyone. It's not for certain people who can get that experience or already have that experience out in the industry or are good self-learners. Um, so I think some of Lewis's isn't, uh, criticism... Isn't a large chunk of Columbia, Columbia's intake, like 40% or something, people who are in the industry or have been in the industry? Are you saying they're all making a mistake? No, it, it changes. I mean, some J schools do target either young journalists or experienced uh, folks or unexperienced folks. Uh, Columbia's a pretty decent mix now, uh, but it has gotten slightly younger over the years, I think. Uh, it's not it for everyone. It's for, I'm sorry? Yeah. It is a grad school, and, That's true. and USC is undergraduate, and I think grad as well. That's right. Um, so, so it varies. So it has some mid-career people in it, for sure. That's right. Columbia seems to be the, uh, the, the target of a lot of uh, criticism, mainly because it's a big target, and it's grad only, so you can make a lot of uh, um, analyses on whether you should even go in the first place, whereas that's not necessarily the case for undergrads. Right? If I can jump in on this, like I think one of the reasons for my understanding and my impression, I haven't been following you know, Columbia real closely recently. It's not as much on my radar. I don't do as much media criticism as I used to. But um, when I was doing it, I think one of the reasons why Columbia was a target was that it was so um, defiantly old-fashioned in a lot of ways. I mean, choosing Steve Cole is like is just an iteration of that tendency. I don't think I think Steve Cole's an amazing journalist. 
I don't think you need to have Twittered in order to be a good, you know, uh, professor of journalism or even a good dean. I think that if the attitude of the school is to treat online media as a novelty, which is what it feels like Columbia has done, then that's not such a good thing. I mean, I think ideally when people, I mean, I'm more or less, I'm biased against J schools personally. I mean, I think that they actually make sense mid-career more than any other time. Um, if you're looking to do your thing in a new way or find a new um, sort of track in journalism, it makes sense to me, but I'm always telling young kids not to go, sorry. Um, but uh, I, I think that, you know, ideally, like, new media should just be media, you know, because a lot of the times when we try to take new media and, and tell people what it's about, we get into the problem we were discussing earlier, the news app problem, you know, which is that people, our audience decides how to consume us. We have very little choice about like if, as, a, as a writer, like I have very little, you know, control, getting back to the control issue, over how people read my stuff, you know. I mean, unless I, unless, unless I try to, like, peg it somewhere, put it behind a firewall, or, or chain it to something specific, then that just limits the audience. So it sort of feels like to me, like, the emphasis in journalism school should be, I mean, God, I, I, I know I'm old-fashioned, but it should be on writing and editing and, like, making things in narrative and making things make sense. And all of that, you can apply those skills to any media, you know? And then there's the sort of the technical side of it, which is also important, like, how do you, you know, do that? And I, I, I will push back a bit. You know, I will say the, you know, very rarely do I agree with Michael Wolf on anything, but I think he kind of <laughs> got something right here. And um, this, these are vocational schools. There's, there's really no reason to have journalism school unless they prepare you for a life in journalism. And the life of a modern day journalist is not the life that Steve Cole has led as a journalist. To a first approximation, zero of the Columbia Journalism School graduates are going to go on to become Steve Cole. And I think the idea that, you know, one can and should sort of hold up this guy who's writing 800 page books about Exxon as like the highest expression of what these people can and will be doing is a little bit um, unrealistic to say the least. I don't think it's the highest expression. And I think, Anna, to your point, that it's not actually, you know, writing and editing anymore. I think that, I mean, for one thing, there's a lot more reading involved. Reporting today is, um, a, in, in large part, reading things on the Internet. It is actually a huge part of what you do as a journalist, um, which never used to exist before. There's, you know, the, the Steve Coles of this world, you know, find out information through shoe leather, shoe leather investigative reporting which is still important, but is much, it, it, it is not, it doesn't have the same kind of primacy that it used to. And the medium does change the way that you express things. So, whereas in a sort of, you know, Steve Cole world or even an Anne Marie Cox world, what you're doing is you're creating these self contained pieces of writing with a beginning and the middle and an end. Um, in a digital world, as we move into these kind of streams of information, um, that's going to change. And, you know, we're going to be moving from stories to streams, and that's a very interesting move, and I don't think that Steve Cole is going to have a clue how to deal with that. Okay. I have to push back to your pushback, um, <laughs> which is that I think that, you know, it, I do think it would be not a good thing if, if what happened was to hold up Steve Cole's career as the ideal career to have. But I do think, I, get, I hope that people will still be writing 800-page books about corporations moving forward. I mean, that would be a career to have. Like, that would be, I, would, I want that to exist as a path for some journalists. Sure. You know? But the fact is that but, these kids are paying $55,000 in tuition plus but another But But the community needs to acknowledge that that's not, that's not going to be a path for everyone. Sure. You or know. 99% of the people well, that you... okay, but like, I... But, but it's it's just the case. This is that, a vocational school. Well, you right. But also, I wanted to point out that you know, shoe leather has often led to the library. You know, I mean, the reason why we read stuff online and we didn't in the past is because there wasn't an online. Like we had to leave the house and pound the pavement because there wasn't a way to bring the information to the house. Like right. I don't think there's a huge, huge difference between the kind of reporting that's done today and the kind of reporting people did 
40 years ago in the sense that it is about gathering information. Any good reporter 40 years ago was going to be reading, you know, was going to be reading a lot of stuff and interviewing. I mean, it's not like we suddenly discovered reading. We suddenly discovered, you know, quantitative research. Like, that, that's existed. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I guess I have this idea that, you know, if someone goes to journalism school with the idea that what they're going to be doing with their lives is writing a series of 800-page books, they should be disabused of that notion. Yes. Well, like, even a series of 800-word articles. Well, what? that's not going to happen either. No, I mean, no. I mean, that there should be an acknowledgement of what the real world, you know, what the real market is, you know. And I mean, to be fair, Columbia has, you know, Sri Srinivasan is there, who's put a focus on social media and has a social media weekend that he puts on. And they are pushing more into not only kind of technology and yeah. digital, but also I know Steve Cole kind of came out and said he believes in kind of the medical school idea that you are going to learn by by doing and not just by going into lectures. And I know this is a movement at USC and a lot of other schools to actually get journalism students to go and create content right almost from the start. Um, and, and within news organizations, I mean, look at the partnerships between NYU and the New York Times and um, USC and LA Times. And, you know, there's been a lot of uh, overlap yeah. where they're well, trying to get the journalism on, students By the way, the, the partnership between the NYU and the New York Times is now defunct, has died, and has now been picked up by New York Magazine because it didn't work. But, yeah, never mind that. But, you know, did it, it might not have worked as a publication, but maybe it worked as far as giving the students real-world experience. I know Berkeley also has Mission Local and is working with Berkeley side and some other things. So they're trying some things. Those publications might not be successful in and of themselves, but if they give the students real world experience is going beyond, you know, then it becomes more of a, of a vocational school and they're actually learning something real world. So I'd like to ask all four of you, if given the cost of going to Columbia is about $85,000 a year, it's a graduate school, and um, as such, you can assume that if you don't go to Columbia, you could probably be earning, say, at least $25,000 a year, which means that the total all-in cost, including the opportunity cost of going to Columbia, is, what, 110 plus per year. Does anyone think that going to Columbia is something which is really worth $110,000? Not of my own money. <laughs> <laughs> if I had rich parents, my parents. or... Or a grant or financial aid, I'm happy for that much to be spent on my journalism education. But you know, I mean, none of it, none of these, none of these models really make sense. I mean, but neither is it is it worth going to you know what you know NYU or studying with Jeff Jarvis at at, at CUNY. You know, it's, no, that's it's just what it's absolutely not. Costs. You're absolutely right. And this is and this is I mean the real the only reason I push this and and Matt Iglesias made this point that it's late. Is that when we, we, you know, every so often on this podcast, we will come back to this whole thing about people working for free and how it's really bad to work for free. But working for free is so much of a better deal than paying $110,000 for the privilege of working. My, my 30 second version of this, because we definitely need a longer episode about this, is that, again, not for everyone. J School is not for everyone. And if you have a specific targeted idea of what you want to do with your career and J School gets you there, whether you want to be documentary maker, 60 Minutes producer, or in, in these things, I think it can be worth it. But I think this is more of a problem with higher ed in general, not just J schools, is that we are selling a bad product at too high a price. And uh, we need to resolve this really soon. Otherwise, um, you know, the whole thing is going to come collapsing down. And, you know, Columbia is probably not over 110,000 USC is. But, uh, you know, you're, you can get an education like 80, 90, but that's still expensive. You know, okay. it's, it's, it's not going to, you're not going to pay it back quickly. Yeah, yeah, I think we could also make, I mean, I I have in the past six months actually had a conversation with a young person uh, who I wound up saying, you know what, maybe you shouldn't go to college. Like, the whole, I mean, I do think the problem is a general higher ed problem. Like, she, in her particular case, like, she's been working in the real world for a while. She's gained some skills that are, are all she needs if she wants to make a career out of this. So why should she go back? You know, she's not going to gain. The reason to go to school is gaining contacts, gaining skills. You know, um, 
And then there's the nice thing, like, I, you know, I went to a liberal arts college and I read a bunch of shit that I wouldn't read otherwise. You know, I mean, that, if, you, if that's worth how much I paid for it, I guess I have to believe that it is because I do use that knowledge sometimes. But, you know, I mean, but it's not for everybody. Like, but anyway, we, we should definitely have a special episode. Yeah, I, I think there's plenty we can talk about on journalism education and communication school and when it's right for people. And there's been plenty of self-made people who can figure it out on their own. Um, and it's just such a high cost and the online education is moving up so f quickly that it seems inevitable that the cost will change. Um, so anyway, we will uh, we'll return to that another time. Next week we're going to talk about the evolution of advertising, native ads and new forms of advertising. We'll have kind of a special um, podcast on that. But we want to thank Doug Roshkoff for joining us. Um, don't forget about his book, Present Shock, that just came out recently. Um, Anna Marie Cox from The Guardian. Andrew Lee from USC. Felix Salmon from Reuters. Monica Guzman. Couldn't make it this week, but hopefully next week. Uh, we'll catch you next time. Take care. <laughs>